Great. Thanks so much, Kate. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for being flexible with my scheduling. Um, and yeah, and thanks everybody for the opportunity today to um, present this work to you. Um, I'm excited to do so. So uh, the agenda today, first, we're going to talk a little bit about what a, a benchmarking tool is and how, we, how we've how we used them traditionally and how we might be able to use it in the future to help our patients. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this concept of visual analogies, which is a novel way of communicating um, numerical information, specifically numerical health information. And then finally, you're going to spend most of the time talking a little bit about or talking about the project that I've been working on called Pictures for Comparison, which is designing a patient facing a benchmarking tool. So um, a benchmarking tool um, was designed initially for businesses to measure the performance of a company's products, services, or processes against those of another business, typically considered to be best in the industry or best in class. And really, the goal of benchmarking is to identify internal opportunities for improvement. And Clinical organizations frequently use benchmarking tools to improve their clinical outcomes for patients by comparing specific metrics to, an, to the average performance across a group of hospitals or clinical organizations. And here's an example of a benchmarking tool that we use um, at Seattle Children's um, through an organization that we participate in called NAPRATIX, which stands for the North American Pediatric Renal Trials and Collaborative Studies which is a group of over 50 pediatric institutions that provide care to children with kidney disease. And this specific benchmarking tool is looking at kidney graft survival after um, transplant. And we participate in a variety of collaboratives, all designed to improve the lives of um, kids with kidney disease. Napratix, there's a, another collaborative called um, Improving Renal Outcomes, which is really a transplant collaborative. Um, and then SCOPE, which is looking at improving outcomes for um, kids on dialysis and really reducing um, infectious complications. And these tools have been very helpful for us and others to um, improve outcomes for our patients that we take care of, but they're really designed to drive improvement at the organizational level. And so what if we could actually do something similar for individual patients? Specifically, could we create a patient-facing benchmarking tool designed to help individuals who've had a kidney transplant and really to drive their own improvement by identifying opportunities that can maximize their own health and longevity and ultimately um, address and overcome previously unrecognized barriers. But while the um, clinical benchmarking tools provided inspiration for this idea of a patient-facing benchmarking tool, it's not just as simple as flipping the computer around and showing the tools that we have to our patients. These tools that we use typically um, present um, benchmarking data in ways that aren't really accessible to patients. For example, um, using Kaplan-Meier curves um, because of challenges with um, numeracy. And so what is numeracy? And numeracy is really the ability to access, use, interpret, and communicate mathematical information and ideas in order to engage in and manage the mathematical demands of a range of situations in life. And in health, numeracy describes someone's ability to understand clinical um, and public health data. And it's really key to understanding risk and, and to be able to actively participate in health-related um, decision-making. And so I'm, I wanna share with you all a study that was done um, about almost, or just under 20 years ago, but really um, is the, the, the only major study we have that actually looks at health numeracy as a separate entity from health literacy. Because a lot of times we talk about health literacy, but we don't necessarily think about health numeracy. Um, and how we can't just assume that if someone has a high level of health literacy, that they also have high health numeracy. So in this study, um, they took a cross-sectional study of 200 primary care patients, and they looked at food nutritional labels, and they administered a 24-item um, survey assessing comprehension um, of, of, of a nutrition label, and they specifically looked at and compared literacy and numeracy levels within the study group. And so within this group, 77, excuse me, 77 percent of participants had ninth grade or higher um, literacy skills, but only 37 percent 
of participants had ninth grade or higher math skills when assessed using um, standardized numeracy assessment scales. And what I found even more interesting was that if we look at the subset of people who had higher or ninth grade or higher literacy skills, a very small number of them actually had this had um, high numeracy skills. And in fact, almost 50% had numeracy skills that were below the ninth grade level with a third of them having numeracy skills below the sixth grade level. So again, this it's important to recognize that these are two different elements and we need to think about them separately, especially when we're trying to communicate health information. And when we think about all the things that we communicate with our patients, specifically numbers, graphs, and stuff like that, it's we have to question whether or not our participants really understand, or excuse me, our patients really understand what we're sharing with them. And this actually is described in a paper that was published um, back in 2010 in CJSON, which actually looks specifically at the numeracy skills in patients with chronic kidney disease. And in this prospective cohort study of 187 patients with with uh, people with stage four, five um, CKD and also with ESRD, um, there was a high prevalence of limited numeracy where over 50% of the patients were able to answer uh, or answered one or fewer numeracy um, questions um, correctly, meaning this is a very common problem within um, our population. Unfortunately, we have zero data on this in um, pediatrics, though. It would be interesting to see if we, the numeracy levels in kids is this, or limited numeracy levels in kids is the same as adults, um, given that kids are actively participating, many kids are actively participating in, in math classes in school. And there might even be, the numeracy levels might be a little bit higher, but something that we need to explore in further research. But basically what this means is that we need a better way to communicate uh, numerical health information to patients. And one opportunity is to use something called visual analogies. And a visual analogy is a way to systematically compare two concepts where one concept's familiar and one concept is unfamiliar through the use of graphics or visualizations. And here's an example of a visual analogy. I'm trying to communicate um, um, lung functioning um, for people with asthma. And here you can see um, a belt squeezing a pair of lungs, which is used as an analogy to describe the bronchoconstriction experienced by um, these patients. And so the familiar concept is the belt tightening and the unfamiliar concept is bronchoconstriction and bringing those two things together. Um, and there's actually evidence to show that the use of visual analogies um, it can actually be successful in communicating numerical health data. So this was a um, work done by a group out of Cornell um, from a few years ago that actually looked at testing visual analogies and their ability to communicate health information. And specifically, they look, compared four different visual methods of um, communicating um, longitudinal patient reported outcome data. Um, specifically looking at physical functioning, and they did this in 40 hospitalized patients. And they compared these four scenarios where scenario A was a text-only scenario, scenario B is text and the visual analogy, where they use the idea or the concept of a fuel gauge to be an analogy for, for functioning. When your um, functioning is low, it would be analogous to an empty fuel tank, and high functioning would be analogous to a, a full fuel tank. The third scenario was um, text and line and um, a number line. And the fourth scenario was um, text and a, a, a line graph, which is the way we typically communicate information. And when they looked at um, the participants ability to correctly comprehend what these images or what these panels were communicating, the one that scored the lowest was actually the line graph with only 60% of participants accurately comprehending what that panel was communicating. And the highest was actually the um, panel B, which was the visual analogy. And there, and the participants significantly comprehend or were able to comprehend the visual analogy significantly better than the text only and line graph um, conditions. And so this shows that there might be better opportunities for us to communicate this important information to our uh, participants. And so basically this background for the use of visual analogies 
the, the potential benefits of creating a benchmarking tool led us to, to the creation and the work that I'm now going to present is a project that we're calling Pictures for Comparison. And really is can we create or can we use visual analogies to communicate key health information to build patient-centered benchmarking tools that support patient-derived um, in, um, improvement opportunities. And so uh, in this work, um, we set out to answer these three research questions. So the first is what questions do pediatric and adolescent kidney transplant patients want to ask other um, patients when comparing their kidney transplant experiences? The purpose of that question is to inform what type of content we would put in a benchmarking tool. The second question, how do pediatric and adolescent kidney transplant patients want to visually compare clinical results and adherence? So starting to give us ideas of how we would create visual analogies or um, what methods we could use to inform visual analogies. And then finally, specifically evaluating um, series of visual analogies by wondering, asking how can we design novel visualizations that support the information needs of pediatric patients and their families after receiving a kidney transplant. So uh, we set out to recruit prevalent kidney transplant recipients with relatively well-functioning graphs. They needed to be at least 10 years old. They had to be at least six months post-transplant. Um, we recruited both English and Spanish-speaking participants, and they needed to have internet access, given that um, this was done during the pandemic and was all done remotely. We recruited participants at our own organization, as well as through the Improving Renal Outcomes Collaborative and through some colleagues at Johns Hopkins. Um, the study was divided into three components. The first design session was a series of separated youth and caregiver focus groups where participants had an opportunity to ask each other questions about their kidney transplant experiences. The second design session was also a series of focus groups where the goal was to create visuals that would support um, comparisons, specifically comparing clinical results and adherence, and participants worked individually and collaboratively in designing these items. And in the final um, session, we engaged in one-on-one -on -one interviews where we tested um, a series of uh, visuals that we as the research team created um, and to get their feedback. And all of these sessions, like I said, were done on Zoom um, since we did this um, during the pandemic. So we were able to recruit 30 individuals to participate in the study um, spread across four different cohorts. We had 14 transplant recipients and 16 caregivers. And here are the characteristics of the transplant recipients. They ranged in age between 10 and 21 years. 21% were Spanish speaking, which I was very proud about because it's more than double what our Spanish speaking population is. 70% um, of participants had a deceased donor transplant and 85% had a prior history of dialysis, which I think is important to frame kind of the results that I'm about to share with you. So um, now I'm gonna go into some of the findings from our work. And so in the first um, design session, remember these were a series of focus groups where we divided um, youth and caregivers into different groups, divided them into um, different breakout rooms um, and had about three to four participants in a group. Individuals had an opportunity to introduce themselves and then ask each other questions about their transplant experiences. Um, the youth questions, basically were kind of categorized into two different big buckets, more concrete questions such as, you know, have you had any medical issues related to your transplant and things a little bit more abstract, such as what does it mean to feel, to feel normal? Do you enjoy having a kidney transplant or do you hate it? When we look at the types of questions the parents had for each other, we can divide them into three different categories such as you know, how have they overcome challenges that they've had with their um, children? How have they um, focused on dealing with their own feelings and fear? And unsurprising, given that these are pediatric patients who ultimately need to transition, is how have they, how have they dealt with those transition tasks and building kind of um, self-management skills within their um, children? 
And really that first design session was design, was set up to be kind of an icebreaker to get people to know each other and to feel comfortable. But really the second design session was really what we focused on um, in this project. And this was where individuals and participants had an opportunity to create multiple visual analogies on topics such as clinical results and adherence. And to support this, we actually mailed design kits to the participants, which included all the supplies that they would need, um, as well as um, the tasks that they were going um, to complete. And so in the first task that we had participants perform was we asked them to draw a line graph that shows their individual creatinine over time. And here you can see some examples of the drawings that we, we got from our participants. The first two on the left are from our um, patient participants and the, the two on the right or in the middle, I should say, are our caregiver participants. And you can see for the most part, these are concrete um, drawings, though what we start to see some elements of emotions and feelings kind of um, layered on top of, of, these, um, of these graphs. We also asked participants to draw what a perfect creatinine level um, looks like. And again, we can start to see some of that emotion um, um, brought into, into their drawings. But as you look at these, I wanna point out two issues that we saw with, with this task. The first, one of our 12 year old participants wasn't even able to complete or to draw a line graph despite us giving them an example for them to use as a reference. And second, I wanted to share with you the challenges that we saw with numeracy. So here's a 15 year old patient who basically drew a perfect creatinine level with the numbers going up over time as you would expect, um, but the line actually is going down. And so there's a disconnect between the numbers and the line graph itself. Um, so again, it does show that maybe we also do have numeracy challenges in our population as well. So because of these challenges and because of the lack of, for better terms, of, of creativity that we saw in the drawings, we basically um, revamped our protocol and asked the participants to draw how their kidney function has changed over time and didn't bring in the constraint of using a line graph. And when we provided this prompt, we got a lot um, richer um, drawings um, and here's some examples of that. And we saw lots of different emotions and feelings that were included in the images. And I wanna highlight um, two or a few actually. So the, this is one from a 14 year old participant. Um, and this is what they had to say about their, um, their, their drawing representing kidney function. So this is before and after my transplant, before it was getting close to where I was going to need dialysis. I got mine before and I was able to get it before I was able to go onto dialysis. So I drew this and used the emoji things on the side. So basically the green and yellow represents the kidney, the function basically, the kidney function. So the green, it's like it's functioning how it's supposed to. Yellow is functioning, but it's getting worse over time. And red is that you need to go back on or go onto dialysis or get a kidney tr um, transplant. And so that's what this represents. So my comparison was to how I was feeling and how my kidney was functioning like before when my kidney was not functioning well and I was not feeling as good. But now after the transplant, I'm feeling a lot better than how I used to. This was a drawing by one of our adult participants, which I found very kind of um, moving. And I wanna just read to you how they describe this picture. First, he start off by saying they're not the greatest artists, which I would disagree with, but here they talk about little bombs, bombs. And we know what the numbers are. And then the question marks is that we don't know anything about what was going on in their child's life until boom, all of a sudden we found out that he needed a kidney transplant and just devastated our life and his life. And it's like somebody dropped a bomb on us. And then we still have all these other little bombs on the other side with fuses lit because we just don't know how this new kidney is going to do. And that's just why the question mark, it's just the unknown. You know what I'm saying? The last image I wanted to share with you from our participants is this image of a blossoming flower and how they use this flower to represent the new life that they, that they saw in their child 
after they received a kidney transplant and showed kind of this transition of a blossoming flower and how the flower relates as really a visual analogy to the life that they saw re-given back to their child um, after um, having a, a transplant, which again, I found kind of very inspiring after seeing this, um, this image. So I wanna move on to some of the images that we saw um, from, um, from our participants with regards to adherence. So these are examples of images um, from our youth participants, where we ask them to draw pictures describing things that support them being successful with taking their medication. And we see examples of pill boxes, watches with alarms, getting a good amount of sleep, not having distractions, taking food or eating food. This is compared to some of the drawings we saw from our participants when we asked them to, to draw pictures of, of things that get in the way of them being successful. And unsurprisingly, we see lots of examples of video games and um, that really interfere with people um, being successful taking their medications. Another really inspiring analogy that we saw was from one of our um, older participants who drew this idea of um, a battery. And they, they, they use the analogy of an um, adherence battery to represent how successful they were at taking their medication. And they extended the analogy in the sense that the battery needs to be charged and the charging was coming from their family and other support mechanisms that helped them to be successful um, with um, um, taking their medications on time. Lastly, for the adherence um, um, visuals, I wanted to share this visualization or these visualizations from our um, caregivers who represented all the barriers that they had within their life of being successful with taking medications. And if what you notice here, especially in the upper right is a calendar where they identified days where their child was not successful or may have been late in taking the medication. And they drew things that got in the way, such as going or playing sports, going on vacation, playing or um, listening to music, hanging out with friends, um, going for a bike ride. So the, fact, the act of participating in life, which is the reason why we do a transplant to begin with, was actually the thing that was getting in the way of our participants' lives, which I found just, again, very eye-opening. Um, to have that insight into the barriers that participants uh, face. So lastly, for the third design session, we took those visuals from our participants and they inspired us to create our own visuals um, to gain or to, to evaluate how we might be able to create visual analogies for the purposes of creating a benchmarking tool. So we showed them these visualizations in individual interviews to, and to get feedback and more specifically to evaluate these individual designs ability to communicate information effectively. And then lastly, we asked participants to complete a survey where they um, could share what type of information they would want in a benchmarking tool and specifically what features they'd wanna compare with each other. So here's the first um, visualization that we created and this was inspired by the, uh, by the kidney um, the drawing that I shared with you. And here, and what we did is we tried to bring in a lot of the emotions that we were hearing from our participants. And so you have a kidney whose emotions would change depending on their kidney function. And so here, because their kidney function is relatively good with a creatinine of 0 0.9, a relatively high GFR, which was represented at the top of this line graph here. Um, so the kidney's happy. And the line, the dotted line represents their GFR and each of these individual kidneys represents other um, peers who, um, GFR. And you can see how their kidney, how their, this, one person's kidney function compares to others and they'd be able to change and look at this over time. Participants overall found this visual appealing. They did have some questions a little bit about what the different kidneys meant and, and what the dotted line meant, 
but I think overall it was an effective visual. But it raised some concerns to us on the research team as well as some of our clinical colleagues is what would happen if their kidney function was actually relatively poor with the high creatinine and the low GFR, and they could see that they were actually at the bottom of this comparison, and how would that impact their own feeling, self-efficacy, ability to engage in their own self-care. Another um, visual analogy we created was this idea of the flower inspired by that one drawing here where the flower represents different stages of CKD with stage one being a vibrant healthy flower and stage five being a wilting or dying flower. People understood this, it made sense to them, but again, I'm not sure how many people would want to be represented as a dying or wilting flower, especially in the later stages of kidney disease. And so I think we really need to be careful about some of these concepts um, as we move forward. Here's one of the visualizations we created for adherence, which was inspired by the calendar idea where there's all these competing factors that support and, um, and, and inhibit people's ability to be successful with taking their medication. And we used a scale analogy where the scale would tip depending on if they're being successful or not. Um, while we think it's a clever idea, it totally failed. Nobody understood it. They had no idea what we were talking about. So this one, unfortunately, um, is not something we're gonna move forward with. We did further develop the battery concept where we specifically showed the concept of a battery being charged and how um, we bring in the elements that actually supported their adherence levels there and actually being able to compare adherence levels across participants by specifically comparing that battery. And again, um, our participants found this um, intriguing and I think they mostly understood it, though it was a design that came out from our latter group, so it wasn't something that we tested in a, in, a, in a lot of people. And then lastly, I just wanna share with you the results of the survey. Um, and here is the res results from the youth survey where we asked them what type of information they'd wanna compare. And what was interesting to us is that they were really interested in comparing what types of extracurricular activities their peers were participating in, how they're doing in school, but very few actually wanted to compare clinical outcomes. And this is in comparison to their caregivers who basically wanted to compare everything, including things like how their children were feeling, how, but they also really did wanna look at clinical outcomes. And so this suggests that we might need to create different iterations depending on our audience. So um, in conclusions, you know, what we've taken away from this work is that kidney function is really, or our participants and our patients really look at kidney function through the lens of how they're feeling and how that kidney function kind of further induces future feelings and emotions. Um, and that we need to incorporate that into our designs. You know, the youth and adults have different information needs that's something that we'll need to take into consideration. And we really need to think about what are the potential negative effects of this work and need to make sure that we aren't introducing harm. And over the summer, we're actually starting work on incorporating all these findings into a new benchmarking prototype. Um, and here actually is what those uh, prototype looks like. And we're calling this app, My Transplant Track, Thinking, Reflecting and Empowering Kidney Patients. And hopefully we'll be able to share results with, um, with the community and with you all um, um, in the future. And finally, I just wanna thank everybody for um, your um, attention. And I really wanna thank the team um, who was responsible for all this work um, on the left, as well as my collaborators on the right. And also wanna thank um, NIDDK for supporting this work through my K. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ari. Uh, questions for Dr. Pollock. I have a question. Um, sorry about the chat to everyone. I was um, really intrigued by your presentation and I was wondering if you could help me understand a little bit if somebody is, you know, like an eighth grade uh, numeracy literacy, does that mean that they can interpret a graph or what, it, what, what would like a, a interpreting a graph or a, a table um, be like in terms of um, grade 
uh, numeracy literacy? Oh yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, I think um, uh, it depends on what type of graph you're looking at, and specifically what type you know what what tool you're using. But yeah, I would think that kind of a ninth grade level um, math would be kind of basic. You know, um, thinking about dependent independent variables and how the dependent or independent variables inform the dependent variables. And so that would be basically a, a line graph there. But um, um, I actually haven't seen how they've classified that. And it's something that we kind of need to dive into a little bit more detail about what are the limitations and kind of where those kind of different cutoff points are. So, but I appreciate your question. I think we'll keep it to just one more question for time. Uh, Dr. Ng, I see your hand up. Um, I'm Yuhan, I'm one of the transplant nephrologists. I think this is amazing. Um, I just have a question. I, I don't know if I missed it. Was there a baseline? Did you guys survey the numeracy and literacy of the participants to know, you know, like, is are these high numeracy literacy participants and should we include more participants of different levels? Yeah, that's a great question. We did not do that um, in this group. There aren't actually well validated tools to use in the adolescent population. Um, it's something that actually I think we would like to look at, but it's not. But it's not something that we actually did um, as part of this group. And so I think it would be something that would be important to do in future work for sure. Well, thank you so much. Totally fascinating work. 